lesson we are going to discuss about uh, the types of silkworms and the life histories of uh, different silkworms and we all know that uh, open university department of zoology has introduced this sericulture first time as uh, course 4b in final year that is bsc final year uh, zoology courses and uh, this silkworms especially four types of silkworms we are uh, uh, using for production of silk especially in andhra pradesh one is bombyx mori and tassa silkworm and uh, moga silkworm and uh, eri silkworm and uh, we want to know about the life histories and uh, the morphological structures of uh, all the stages of silkworms and this is a very lengthy uh, topic so that's why we are divided this topic into two lessons the first part that is uh, part 1 is about the mulberry silkworm its morphological structures and uh, the structures of uh, different types of larvae and uh, the total life history of mulberry silkworm and for discussing this topic we have invited uh, one of our uh, the most important uh, resource person uh, professor purushottam rao garu and professor purushottam rao garu he is a retired professor from uh, kakatiya university varangal so we are inviting you to discuss this topic uh, today and about the silkworms uh, that is bombyx mori silk garments are very popular among all types of people because of its lightness because of its lustrous nature because of its softness and because of its popular colors and the silk garments are made with the fiber which is produced by an insect it is a natural fiber there are various types of uh, silk the most popular and important one is mulberry silk there are also non mulberry varieties like tassar eri and moga today we are taking up the details of the mulberry silk worm and its life history mulberry silk worm which is coming under the phylum arthropoda class insecta order lepidoptera the family is bombycidae and the scientific name of this insect is known as bombyx mori the specific characteristics of this insect are it has got uh, scales on the body by which it is coming under the order lepidoptera bombyx mori is monophagous it feeds exclusively on the mulberry leaf alone mulberry plant is perennial in nature it grows lustrously and available in all types of the soil and it's also possible for the farmers to cultivate this crop by pruning regularly so that he can have high yield of the leaf you can see here a typical variety of the mulberry leaf i am showing here the mulberry leaf which is having lot of space with chlorophyll the insect will be feeding on the surface of this uh, leaf and the silk worms will prefer this leaf throughout its life history now let us go into the details of the life history of the silk worm silk worm is having essentially four stages the first stage is called egg stage you can see here egg stage where the silk worm eggs are rounded or flat which are whitish or yellowish in color and silk worm lays these eggs in large number there are three types of silk worms which are univoltine bivoltine and multivoltine which implies univoltine means only one generation per year bivoltine means two generations per year and trivoltine or multivoltine or pentavoltine means many generations more than two generations per year depending upon the tropical and temperate climatic conditions we find the bombyx mori is distributed in the tropical climate which is having multivoltine nature 
that is essentially in our areas we will find in Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, etc., the multivoltain silkworms. And we find bivoltain silkworms in temperate climate, particularly in Darjeeling area, Jammu Kashmir, Japan, China. In these areas where the cold environmental conditions are available, you will find the bivoltain and the univoltain silkworms. The major difference between these three types of silkworms is that the insects have got diapause or which is known as hibernation. The univoltain silkworms will go for hibernation for having only one generation per year, the remaining period this egg will go into diapause and in the bivoltain you will find the silkworm will have two generations and the remaining period of the year it goes into hibernation at the egg stage. But in the case of multivoltain you do not find this diapause, the eggs will be hatchable all through the year. Now you can see the eggs which are on a sheet here, these are known as sheet eggs which are laid by a single moth, this is known as a single egg whereas this single egg will have not less than 350 to 400 eggs and this is in case of multivoltan. In the case of bivoltan and univoltan you will find the eggs are more than 500 laid by a single moth. Now these eggs can also be laid loose eggs depending upon the granage system. Now these eggs will take a minimum of 9 to 11 days to hatch into the larval stage. Now the first stage larva will emerge from the eggs as you can see here the blackish color of the egg which indicates that the head the egg has reached to pinhead stage and from this immediately within a few minutes the larva will emerge out of the eggs. Now this is the first stage of the silkworm. There are in total 5 instars of the silkworm and the first instar is known as ant stage and there are 4 molting stages. As we can see it takes totally about 24 to 28 days for completion of the silkworm life history. The first stage of the silkworm will take about 3 to 4 days and the silkworms as I can show you here in this, these are the 2 stages of silkworms I am showing here. This is the second stage and this is the third stage of the silkworm. Now these silkworms are a little bit grown and they are about uh, 6 to 7 days old and here these silkworms are about 10 days to 12 days old. You will find these silkworms will be feeding on the mulberry leaf and the leaf has to be very tender. These stages, the first stage, the second stage and the third stage of the silkworm are known as the chalky stages. At this stage, the silkworms will prefer to have more of the proteinaceous substances in the nutrition. Therefore, the tender leaf which will have more of the protein content will be given by the farmers to the silkworms at this stage. And lot of care has to be taken at this stage because the bacterial, the viral, the fungal and the protozoan diseases are likely to affect the stages of the silkworm. Hence, the hygienic conditions have to be maintained by having disinfection of the rearing rooms and regular uh, change of the food and bed cleaning by removing the fecal matter like this. The care has to be taken by the farmer. Now, from the second stage to third stage, it will take about uh, 24 hours. That means, the first stage to second stage, it takes 10 to 12 hours for molting second stage to third stage it will take 12 to 14 hours for molting and third stage to fourth stage it will take another 16 hours for molting and fourth stage to 15, uh, fifth stage silkworm the insect will take about 20 hours for molting. Molting is a stage in which the insects will not feed on the leaf, it becomes docile and the farmers normally say that fever, it is affected by fever. So, here you can see this is the fully uh, matured silkworm, this is a 15 star silkworm, early 15 star silkworm. Now, this stage will reach by about 25 days and the silkworms when it is fully grown and which is known as the ripen stage and which is ready for silk synthesis is about 7000 times increased in its weight and 10,000 times it increases in the size of the silkworm as compared to the first stage that is the ant stage. Now at this stage that is the fourth and the fifth instar silkworms will prefer to have fully matured leaf where we will have more of the carbohydrates in the leaf as compared to the proteins in the early stages. Now as you know that the silkworm requires a lot of leaf, a single silkworm it is expected that it will feed not less than 2.5 grams in its total 2.5 kilograms in its total life cycle. Now the total life cycle will take about 28 days by which the silkworm will become fully matured. The silkworms are having the body division as you can see uh, three parts. You can see here this is known as the head stage 
in the head part and this is the thoracic region and this is the abdominal region. And the head region has got mainly compound eyes, mouth parts. The mouth parts are mandibulated mouth parts having the mandibles, maxillae, maxillary palps, labrum the upper lip, labium the lower lip. Now, these uh, mandibles will help for cutting and chewing of the mulberry leaf by the insect. You can see here the thoracic region which is a little bit uh, uh, lobe like structure which is having essentially three segments that is the prothoracic, mesothoracic and metathoracic segments. You can see here the later part which will have about 11 to 13 segments in the abdominal region. The thoracic region has got the appendages which are known as prolex. There are three pairs of prolex very short you can see here which are going to be the legs in the adult moth. There you can see at the abdominal region four pairs of uh, abdominal legs here one, two, three, four pairs and there is one pair which is the caudal legs. So, this is how you can see in the silkworm the first three pairs of prolex which are going to be permanent in the adult and then four pairs in the abdominal region and then one pair in the caudal region which will disappear when it uh, molds into the pupal stage. So, the silkworm will take lot of leaf and it will be converted into the silk. The silk glands are nothing but the modified labial glands inside the body and the silk glands will synthesize the silk which is having two types of proteins. One is fibroin which is about 80 percent of the total silk content and then sercin which is 20 percent of the total protein content. Sercin is a sticky substance, a gum substance which will be dissolved when the cocoons are cooked. Now, these silk worms will go into spinning of the cocoons. You can see here I am showing the cocoon which is having the outer one which is not uh, a clear silk which is known as flossy. When the silk worm is settling down for synthesis of the silk some of the silk will be wasted. So, this is known as the flossy and you can see this flossy is removed at the time of reeling like this peeled off and this is not going to be waste it is a byproduct of the silk and this is also can be used for spun silk purpose. Now, this is the actual shell of the cocoon inside which the silk worm is molded into the pupa you can see here this is the pupa. So, we can easily distinguish the sexes of this pupa also. Now, this pupa will take about 9 to 11 days again for molting into the adult moth. So, before molting into the pupal stage the silk worm will spin this cocoon and which will take about 48 hours for complete spinning of the cocoon. So, this cocoon will have a continuous filament which is about 800 to 1000 meters in the case of multi and silk worm and which is about 1200 to 1600 meters length a continuous fiber in the case of bi and uni and silk worms. So, the shell is used by the farmers for by the reelers for uh, re, uh, unwinding of the cocoon and getting the continuous fiber of the silk. So, this is the part of the reelers job. So, this uh, pupa which is taking about 9 to 11 days will emerge into the moth as you can see here. This is the moth stage and moth is a total non feeding stage, pupa is also totally non feeding stage. The continuous feeding stage is only the larval stage which will leave which will feed on the leaf that is mulberry leaf. Now, the pupa which is uh, uh, easily distinguished as the male and female, the female pupa usually will be bigger in size and which will have x mark at the last segments. You can see this is the last abdominal segment where you can see x mark that is the female genital pore and in the case of males you will find the pupal size would be usually smaller in size and then you can find at the tip of the abdomen a point will be seen a dark point will be seen that is how the sex difference can be made easily at the time of grainage. So, the silk uh, the pupa also will have the indications of the future eyes and compound eyes then the wing structures the appendages the prolex of the larva will be the thoracic legs here in the pupal stage and you can also see part of the wings. Now, from this pupal stage it will be molting into the moth and the moth as it molts you can see here the moth is trying to come out of the cocoon once it is fully matured from the pupa and this moth will emerge from the cocoon after about 9 to 10 days and this moth will be as soon as it emerges within a few hours that is 2 to 3 hours it goes for coupling. So, in this coupling uh, will be continued for about 3 hours then the granite people will be separating out this moth for laying off the eggs by the 
math, uh, female math, which will take for another 24 hours. Now, we are looking at the math here after the metamorphosis of the pupa into the math. This math is coming out of this cocoon and this uh, math, as you can see, how it struggles to come out of the uh, cocoon by secreting saliva. The saliva will loosen the silk shell and uh, it will push itself with the head forward with the mouth parts. The moth will be slowly emerging out of the cocoon. As soon as it emerges out, you can see here the typical structure of the moth. Uh, what we find here is the head region, the thoracic region, the abdominal region and here the head will have the antennae which is pectinate antennae. In the case of female, you can see the antennae are uh, having bushy type of uh, pectinated bifurcated uh, branches of the antennae. The compound eyes are there. The mouth parts here are not mandibulated. It is actually having the sucking type of mouth parts which are uh, proboscis, but here the adult moth does not feed. It only spends its life for about 8 to 10 days. It is only for the purpose of mating and the female moth will go for laying of the eggs, then it will die, it will have a natural death. You can see here on the surface of the moth, uh, lot of uh, scales will be there by which it is also. You can see here, these are the scales. If you look at under microscope, these scales will be pointed. The scales will be protecting as the exoskeleton for the insect. Now, the second part after head you can find is the thorax. The thoracic region is having lot of scales covering inside which it will have musculature. It has got the, uh, on the dorsal side you can have the wings. There are two pairs of the wings you can see. The first pair of the wings are broader, triangular in shape. Then the second pair of the wings are smaller in size. On the ventral side of the thorax you can see three pairs of legs. These legs are again divided having the coxa, trochanter, femur, tibia and tarsal segments. And these legs will help for holding of the opposite sex and uh, these legs are very slender in nature. You can see the abdominal region, the abdomen is uh, lobe like. In the case of females, the abdomen is broader. In the case of males, you can see this is a male insect where you can see the abdomen is uh, narrow as compared to the abdomen of the female. And you can also see at the tip of the abdomen, the male genital organs are clearly seen here as compared to the female genital organs. So, this is how the sex difference is made easily at the pupil stage as well as the adult stage and the uh, moth after coupling for a, about 2 to 3 hours, it will go for uh, decoupling will be taking place, it will be the female moth will be left for laying of the eggs and the egg laying process will continue for about 48 hours after which the female moth is also separated out. So, here the male moth can be used for more than once for mating purpose. The female moth is only used for once and here one important aspect about this uh, uh, cultivation or industry, sericulture industry is the pepperin disease for which the pupa as well as the moth will be tested severely at the uh, granage stages where you will find the pepperin, if it is affected with the pepperin, it will be noted by the identification of the spores under microscope by taking out the squash of the moth body and also earlier by the pupil body and that is how they will identify and they will discard it. Otherwise, if the moth is healthy, then this is known as these layings are known as disease free layings. So, that is how the farmers will be supplied disease free layings where there is no infection at all. If pepperin is affected, there is a possibility that the moth will have even through the ovary, through the eggs, it is transmitted to the next generation. Hence, in the sericulture industry, one important aspect taken care of is with regard to elimination of the pebrin disease by testing them at every stage of the insect life history. Now, we find here that uh, egg is a stage which will go into diapause of the silkworm. Otherwise, in the case of polyvoltane, multivoltane, it is going to have immediate hatching. That is how in the case of uh, uh, our particular area like Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, where the tropical climatic conditions are there, where the insect is uh, uh, developing very well under the temperature of about 28 or 29 even 32 degrees centigrade, here we have got most of the multivoltine. Now, with regard to the distribution of the silkworm, we will find essentially India is having uh, five states which are known as traditionally sericulture oriented. And these are Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, West Bengal, Jammu and Kashmir. 
These are known as terrestrial states where we find the mulberry silkworm is cultivated for more than 200 years. Whereas, there are other states like uh, the central India as well as uh, Bihar, Orissa, etc., where the mulberry silk is there, but it is introduced at a later stage by the government of India. So, we find the silk is originated as we all know from China. So, from China through this so called silk road, it has come from Egypt to India and uh, Japan is uh, also having traditionally sericulture, mulberry sericulture. So, now in the world scenario, we find the mulberry silk is produced maximum by China and India stands next second in the world in the silk production. Andhra Pradesh stands second in the country in the mulberry silk production and in Andhra Pradesh we find uh, particularly Rayalaseema area where Anantapur and Chittur districts have got the highest silk yield. So, this is how we find that in India we have got Karnataka is the first state where maximum of this mulberry sericulture activity is going on. Now, we find that uh, the India is one of the important exporting countries in the mulberry silk also. The annual yield, annual production of the raw silk is estimated to be about uh, 15,000 metric tons, but we have a consumption more than 21,000 metric tons India has got the mulberry consumption at the domestic market itself. So, there is a demand, high demand for the mulberry silk production and the advantage with this mulberry silk is, is the indoor rearing, where the mulberry silk worm right from the egg stage to the adult stage can be developed within the four walls of the house and it does not require any extensive investment also, where with minimum investment, minimum equipment, the mulberry sericulture can be continued. So, it has become very popular in the rural area for the uplift of the uh, poverty stricken areas for the rural agro industry, the sericulture is considered to be the best option and where many farmers are attracted because of the low investment, because of quick development, because of high commercial importance, because of high export value also. Now, India is looking for becoming the uh, um, uh, exporting, major exporting country to particularly western countries where this sericulture is not cultivated. So, it is in competition with China now. China is producing about uh, 52,000 metric tons per annum and Chinese silk is considered to be the best quality because of the bivolt and univolt and strains. Now, mulberry silk we are trying to improve it by importing, by cultivating the bivoltane silk worms and univoltane in place of multivoltane, where you will find the quality of the silk is considered to be the best quality and the cocoon is also very good in shape, structure and reliability. That is how it is considered that we are going to develop mulberry silk with bivoltane and univoltane in the years to come. At the moment, at the commercial level, we have got all the three types and multivoltane has become very popular because of uh, the resistance capacity of the silkworm. This we find that mulberry silk and mulberry silk industry is going to flourish for several years and it is going to attract several farmers not only in these traditional states, but also in the non-traditional states also. The mulberry silk particularly the multivoltane silk is not so popular in the western countries because of the low quality, low denier, high denier and uh, it is not found to be having so much of lustrousness, softness. Therefore, bivoltane silk has become very important and now the central silk board and the state government departments are also trying to improve the bivoltane sericulture by improvising the conditions at the laboratory level and that is how to take it to the farmers level and bivoltane silk is having high commercial value also. And in India particularly, we are using mostly for the domestic market multivoltane for export quality we are producing bivoltane, but at the hybrids level we have got germplasm more than 2000 uh, uh, germplasm in the mulberry silk palm and that is now being extensively used at the research level by the central silk board to develop the bivoltane and univoltane and popularize it among the farmers in various traditional and non-traditional states in the country. Sericulture industry also can be looked from another aspect that the investment is low as I said earlier and it involves not only the youth or energetic people, but also women, old age people, physically handicapped people, children can also manage this at home because it is a domestic and it is indoor rearing activity. Then another important thing is in mulberry sericulture, 
there is not one activity, but more than half a dozen activities we find. The first activity is farmers activity, where we find the mulberry cultivation, which is agro based, which requires land, which requires cultivation with water, irrigation facilities, etcetera. The second aspect is granage, where the seed production, which is again another specialized activity. The third activity is cocoon production, which is again indoor activity, where from the larval stage by feeding on the leaf, we are going to cocoon production. The next uh, uh, professional activity is railers activity, which is again urban oriented, not necessarily rural. And here what is required is railing machines. Then you are going to take out the yarn. Then the other activity is weaving activity. In weaving activity, we go for fabric preparation. Then another activity is dyeing activity, designs preparation, then marketing, then exporting. So, so many professional linkages are there in the sericulture activity, which is going to help several types of people, not only in the rural, but also in the urban areas also. And another important thing is, there is nothing which is going to be a waste in the industry. The mulberry, after use of the leaf, it can be used for decomposition using as a fertilizer, natural fertilizer. Then it is also now in the vermicompost it is being used, the waste leaf is used. Then secondly, the silk floss is also used for designs, various types of sericrafts are also being made. Then the pupae are very important from the point of it has got rich proteins. So, the pupa are also eaten in some of the areas in the tribal areas. And uh, now the pupa are also rich in oil content, which is useful for soap preparation for paints, etc. That is how the pupa are also used after the reeling activity. And uh, there is another important activity is in the sericraft, the shell, the cocoons are used for preparation of the different types of flowers, the different types of garments, different types of uh, ornamental material. That is how the sericraft also is an important aspect where the byproducts, without wasting them, we can use them and which are also having commercial importance in the market. So far, you have learned about uh, the structure of the mulberry silkworm and uh, the different structures of the larval stages of uh, mulberry silkworm and uh, a brief note of the life history of the silkworm. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Purushottam Ravagaru, to come all the way to our studios uh, and introducing that, this topic to our students.